Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and I'm out here at the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba, having a look at a fascinating and very rare piece of World War II German light artillery. This is a 10.5 centimeter Leichtgeschütz 42, and this is one of the first recoilless weapons ever to see combat. It was not, however, the very first. That honor belongs to a weapon designed by one Commander Cleland Davis of the U.S. Navy in 1910. Now, Commander Davis was looking to develop a heavier, more powerful weapon for use on aircraft, specifically naval aircraft, to take out submarines and small surface vessels. Now, unfortunately, the aircraft at the time were relatively fragile and couldn't withstand the recoil from heavier weapons, hence the need for a recoilless design. So Davis's design was based on the countershot principle, which is basically the idea that if you put two guns breach to breach and fire them in opposite directions, the recoil will cancel out. However, you don't want to fire a live shell out the rear of your gun, so instead, Davis's gun fired shells with a propellant charge in the middle, a shell in the front, and a mass of lead shot encased in grease in the rear. So when the charge went off, it would propel the shell out the front and the lead shot out the rear, balancing out the recoil. Now, since you have a large mass of lead shot exiting the rear of the gun at very high velocity, these had to be given very special mountings. Typically, they were mounted in the forward observer scarf ring of a Navy patrol aircraft like uh, Curtis H-16 or HS-2L with the barrel facing downward so that the counter shot would go up and over the aircraft. They were also typically fitted with a coaxial Lewis machine gun, which acted as a spotting rifle, which is a technique still used today. You would fire the machine gun and follow the tracers, and when the tracers intersected the target, you would then fire the recoilless gun. So the Davis gun was built in two, four, and 12 pounder versions, and they were used in limited numbers by both the US Navy and the Royal Navy during the First World War. Now, more modern recoilless guns like the Litgeschutz here work on a similar principle, only instead of using a solid counter shot, they use the gas from the propellant cartridge. Now, since gas is considerably less dense than lead, it needs to be accelerated to a very high velocity in order to achieve the same momentum and balance out the recoil. And this is done using a Venturi, or a converging-diverging de Laval nozzle of the same type used on rocket engines. Now, the development of the Leitgeschutz began in 1937, though the Germans weren't looking to arm aircraft, but rather to give their newly formed airborne troops, the Fallschirmjäger, a form of lightweight portable artillery support that could be broken up and dropped in regular parachute containers. And there were two companies in competition for this contract, Krupp and Rheinmetall, and it was Rheinmetall's design that won out in the end. Now, in order to simplify logistics, Rheinmetall base their design off of shells from existing artillery systems, specifically the high explosive shell from the 7.5 centimeter Gebildsgeschütz, or mountain gun, and the anti-tank round from the 7.5 centimeter Feldkanon 16. But to make these shells work in a recoilless system, the shell casing had to be modified. And how this worked is that the shell casing had a hole in the rear that was plugged with a plastic disc. And this was designed to fragment at a certain chamber pressure. And when this happened, the shell would be pushed out the front of the gun and the gas would be vented out through the venturi in the rear. So Rheinmetall initially designated this weapon the Leichtgeschütz, or Light Gun, LG-1, but soon after the German army adopted a different nomenclature system based on year of adoption, so this became the LG-40. And true to its name, it truly was a light weapon. It only weighed 145 kilos. And just for comparison, the two guns from which it took its shells weighed 750 kilos and 1,500 kilos, respectively. So that's quite a weight savings. And this could be broken down into four different pieces, which could easily be packed into standard paratroop containers. There was also a special version designed for the Gebirgsjäger, the mountain troops, which broke down into five pieces. And this had a firing rate of around eight rounds per minute, 
and a range of about seven kilometers. And the loading system was a sliding breech block. So you would take this handle and you would crank it to the side and this whole breech block along with the Venturi would slide out to the side, you would throw the shell in and then turn the handle back and it would slide back. Now the LG40 began manufacture in 1940 it started to be delivered to the Fallschirmjäger in 1941, and it first saw combat in May of 1942 during Operation Mercure, which was the German airborne invasion of the island of Crete. Now, it was very well liked by the troops that used it. It turned out to be a very handy little gun, but unfortunately it didn't have much of a chance to prove itself as an airborne weapon after this point. This is because Operation Mercure was a very costly Pyrrhic victory for the Germans, and because of this, Hitler mandated that no large-scale airborne operations would be mounted from that point on. So these guns were mainly used by the Gebirgsjäger in Norway, in the Caucasus, and in Italy. However, they were used in at least one more major airborne operation, which was Operation Rosselsprung, or Knight's Move. And this was an SS Fallschirmjäger assault on the headquarters of Yugoslav partisan leader Joseph Tito at Drovar in May 1944. Now, shortly after the LG-40 entered service, Krupp resurrected its failed competitor for the recoilless gun competition and produced an upgraded version in 10.5 centimeters as opposed to 7.5. And just like with Rheinmetall's design, they decided to base their system off of an existing shell, specifically the 10.5 centimeter shell off the Leichte Feldhaubitz or Light Field Howitzer 18, which interestingly enough, the museum here actually has an example of. Now, this was a bigger and heavier weapon than the original LG-40. It weighed about twice as much, but this was not only because it used a bigger shell, but also because it was built completely out of steel, whereas the original LG-40 had a lot of light alloy parts to reduce weight. However, at this point, light alloys were becoming in short supply in Germany, and they're desperately needed in other areas, such as aircraft manufacture. Now, in addition to firing a heavier shell, Klipp's weapon also had a slightly longer range, about one kilometer or more, so eight kilometers in total, and also incorporated a number of mechanical improvements over the original LG-40. So some of the major faults of the LG-40 included the firing mechanism. So like most shells, the shell casing had its primer in the middle of the rear surface. This meant that the firing mechanism, the firing pin, had to be housed in a streamlined casing in the middle of the Venturi tube. And this tended to be worn down very quickly and fail due to the hot gas coming out of the Venturi. So what Krupp did was move the primer to the side of the shell casing, allowing them to move the firing pin mechanism to the side of the breech. Now this required the shell to be loaded in a particular orientation. This was accomplished by providing a boss in the shell casing and cutting a notch in the breech. Now, Theoretically, this would have slowed down loading slightly, but apparently in the field, this wasn't too much of an issue. Now, another major fault with the original Rheinmetall LG-40 was that it tended to shake itself apart after firing around 300 rounds. And it was found that this was due to torque. So when the shell traveled down the barrel and engaged in the rifling, it would impart an equal and opposite torque on the barrel and the rest of the carriage. So to counter this, Krupp installed a series of spiral vanes inside the Venturi that would twist the exhaust gas in the opposite direction, thus countering the torque. So this was a much improved weapon. However, as soon as development on the 10.5 centimeter LG-40 ended, uh, Rheinmetall came in and made their own, basically, copy of it, which was the LG-42, this weapon right here. And it was this one that was actually manufactured and put into combat. So kind of an underhanded move there. However, by 1944, the winding down of German airborne operations and the fact that recoilless weapons tend to consume a lot of propellant uh, caused the Germans to basically order the production of recoilless weapons shut down. And only a couple of hundred of any of these variants were ever produced. So it's actually kind of neat to see one of these here because these are quite rare. But that's not the end of the story when it comes to recoilless weapons during World War II, because several other countries also experimented with the technology. For example, in 1942, the Swedish Carl Gustav company came up with the M42 20mm recoilless anti-tank rifle. 
And if you want to learn more about that, I'd recommend you go over to Forgotten Weapons. Ian has a great video on that. And also I will link a video in the description of somebody shooting one of these things. And the gout of flame that shoots out the rear of the gun is absolutely terrifying. And it's a sobering illustration of exactly why you don't want to be standing behind one of these things when it fires. Now, inspired by the M42, a British inventor named Sir Charles Deniston Burney started experimenting with his own recoilless weapons designs. And he first demonstrated these designs by creating a four-bore duck gun that could actually be fired comfortably from the shoulder. And the British War Ministry was interested enough in this to fund his further research. And what he came up with was a system that was a lot more reliable and easy to manufacture than the German Lichtgeschütz system. So instead of having a plastic disc at the rear of the shell casing, he instead drilled holes in the side of the casing and lined them with a thin sheet of metal, which would burst at a certain pressure, thus venting out the gas. And instead of having the venturi at the rear of the chamber, he had them on the side. And based on this design, he came up with a trio of experimental guns. There was a 3.45 centimeter version that could be fired from the shoulder or from a light gun carriage. There was a 3.7 inch version on a light gun carriage. And then there was a 95 millimeter version on a heavy gun carriage that was intended for use by airborne troops. It could be towed behind an airborne Jeep. He also came up with a 7.2 inch gun, which was intended to take out coastal fortifications during the D-Day landings. And to go with it, he came up with probably an even more influential invention, which is what we call the high explosive squash head or the Hesh shell. He called it the wall buster. And this warhead has a very thin metal casing, which is filled with plastic explosives with a flexible bag around it. So when the shell hits an armored surface, whether a concrete bunker or a tank, the explosive squashes, it spreads out over a larger area before the fuse detonates. And this causes a big shock wave that causes the rear of that armor to spall or fragment. And these are still used as anti-tank shells to this day. However, other methods of breaching the Atlantic wall defenses were developed before D-Day, and Bernie's gun never saw service. However, his designs led directly to the development of the BAT, or Battalion Anti-Tank, series of recoilless rifles that were adopted by the British military starting in the 1950s. And this included the original BAT, the lighter version called the Bobat, and finally the Wombat. Now, the United States also experimented with recoilless weapons, specifically the artillery division of the Research and Development Service. And in order to save time, they decided to just copy the German design wholesale with the plastic disc at the rear of the shell casing. Unfortunately, they ran into many of the same problems, including high venturi wear and the gun shooting out plastic fragments at high speed from the rear of the gun. Meanwhile, however, the infantry division of the Research and Development Service decided to go with Bernie's approach with a perforated shell with a metal liner, and they were much more successful. And from this research, they developed two different weapons, the 57 millimeter T-15 and the 75 millimeter T-21. And these went into production and started being issued to troops in early 1945, and they were used in limited numbers in Okinawa and in Essen in Germany. And these later formed the basis for the post-war M40 106mm recoilless rifle. So since the 1950s, the vast majority of recoilless weapon systems have been based on this early American design. However, there are two notable exceptions still in use today. These are the German-developed Armbust, or crossbow, and the German, Israeli, and Singaporean-developed Matador. And these actually work on a Davis-style countershot system. Only instead of using heavy lead shot as their countershot, they use shredded plastic. So these weapons have a propellant charge in the middle with two sliding pistons. And on one end is the warhead, on the other end is this massive compressed shredded plastic. So when the weapon is fired, the propellant charge pushes the pistons out either end, propelling the warhead forward and the massive plastic rearward. And then the pistons are actually captured at the end of the tube, trapping the propellant gases inside. And this massive shredded plastic quickly disperses and slows down due to aerodynamic resistance, meaning that it can safely be used inside a confined space, such as out of a window, unlike a lot of similar anti-tank weapons. 
However, when that plastic first comes out, it's traveling at quite a decent velocity, which means you really don't want to be standing right behind one when it goes off. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a big thank you to the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum for allowing me to come out here and film this unique piece of history. I've actually arranged to do a lot more filming with them. They have a lot of really neat treasures, both in their public display galleries and in their back rooms, so please stay tuned for that. I think you'll find that really, really cool. Anyway, until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.